It's time for the Daily Planet Podcast Show. So sit back, relax, and give us a go. Scott and Matt and maybe a guest. Undertaking epic pod quest. We're gonna ramble on about movies and books and television and directors and film festivals and this really long list of stuff that I know nothing about, but they gave it to me and they really wanted me to read through it. And that's all I can really say about it, but it's gonna be great. The show. Hello and welcome to the Daily Planet Podcast, your weekly podcast for all things movie, TVs, books, and every, anything else we feel like talking about. It used to be a lot easier for me to say that, and it's gotten more complicated for some I have reason. The same, I have the same problem where it stops being English words and just becomes <laughs> sounds that I'm trying to make, and then it's for some reason impossible. It's funny because I think I, I write it down now, and I never used to write it down. I used to just say it, so I'm reading it. And reading it instead of just instinctually saying it is what confuses me. So yeah. um, anyway, I am Scott Daly and I'm your host. And I'm joined this week once again by my co-host and co-YouTube aficionado, Matt Freeman. Matt, welcome. Welcome back. Yes, thank you. Um, this is uh, something that we've been talking about doing for a while. Uh, just basically talking about YouTube. YouTube. Film on YouTube Film, specifically. Yeah, um, yeah it, it was... Uh, Basically, you and I watch a lot of various YouTube channels that discuss film, and there was a weird um, sort of pushback, I guess, on Twitter against film YouTube channels, Yeah, which made us, first of all, I, I didn't even think of myself as someone who watched a lot of YouTube film content until that <laughs> happened, and then, of course, I had to, now that I've been, you know, pushed into a corner, I felt that I had to defend uh, YouTube film, ch- film channels, and I think it's fairly easy to defend them. Luckily, so uh, that's what we're going to be doing. Yeah, I'm I'm excited about this. We teased this a while ago, and then stupid J.J. Abrams and his mystery box popped up, and we had to reschedule because we needed to talk about that terrible movie, Cloverfield Paradox. Um, mm-hmm. But we're finally back. Yeah, we're finally going to do it. Going to talk about some of our favorite YouTube channels. We're going to talk about the idea of film criticism theory. Um, essays uh, just film studies i guess on youtube.com and yeah. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this conversation yeah me too but first matt we got to get some some stuff out of the way okay it's time for the news this is daily planet news all right um so i i thought I thought about doing another Black Panther update for everyone, um, reading numbers again and, and like becoming more and more awestruck by how the numbers can te- continue to go up faster than a lot of other numbers have gone up. But it seems just kind of unnecessary at this point. Um, Black Panther is killing it. It is going to be one of the biggest superhero films ever. Um, it's already the biggest origin story superhero film. Um and all it has to pass is some of the team up films, and I think The Dark Knight, which it's going to pass. It's going to pass The Dark Knight, Matt, which is insane. Um, that's Black Panther. Amazing. Yeah, that's cool. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, the next piece of news I had for you this week, Matt, is Apple. Apple is getting into the streaming game. This is something they've been talking about for a while, um, but this week they landed M Night Shyamalan's next project, a, a TV series. It's it's currently an unknown psychological thriller series that I'm sure we'll have a bunch of twists and turns risky choice yeah <laughs> um well is it is it though because like he was he was out for a while but um but m night is back in his last two movies were, were received positively so the world loves him again yeah yeah i suppose so um he's he's got a a, a spotty track record i mean I, I that's the thing i like m night i love um, i love m night yeah i don't know if i've seen um I haven't seen his latest thing actually, but uh, it, it's just it's a bold move. I don't think I don't think it's uh, controversial to say that this is a bold move. Uh, we'll see though. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, and this um, this comes on the back of of them making other uh, equally bold moves because per deadline over the last couple of months, Apple has ordered a Damien Chazelle that's a La La Land and Whiplash drama series, a Steven Spielberg's Amazing Stories reboot, a morning show drama starring Reese Witherspoon and Jennifer Aniston, a comedy series top-lined by Kristen Wiig, a space drama from Ron Moore, and a world-building drama series called C from Stephen Knight and Francis Lawrence. So uh, 
Apple has a lot of money, Matt, and they're uh, yeah. they're using it. Do we know what world building drama series means? No, <laughs> I have no idea what that means. That's very, a, I mean, tell me what a space drama is. That kind of makes sense. A world building drama series, kind of, that's just a very evocative. I can't imagine yeah, what that is. I have no idea. I have no idea. But I mean, so how do I mean how do you feel about this? Because like, I feel like we're inundated by streaming services already. Uh, Disney is looming on the corner collecting stuff for their streaming service. There's going to be like 16 Star Wars shows on Disney's service. Um, now Apple wants to get into the game and do their own. And are we are, are we reaching the, the explosion point of this? Like, is there going to be just too many? I kind of feel like there's already too many. Because um, <laughs> I don't pay for, like, I don't pay for YouTube Red. I don't pay for Hulu. Um, yeah. And, and I... Uh, there was what channel what channel is it that does like the the new star 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 trek um, I, even, I believe it's like abc has see, their own streaming service see i don't even i can't even say whether that's true or not and yet i'm like the target audience for a new star trek show right um so that to me like like i'm fully aware there's a new star trek show and that's it's either good or okay and i've made absolutely no effort to try to watch it because it's paywalled right and that to me is like, yep, we've passed the point of you trying to get me to pay $10 a month for too many different things. <laughs> right. Well, we've done this thing where most people have gotten rid of cable by this point. So in the old uh, in the old method, everyone paid for cable and you got a bunch of channels and things were put on those channels and there you got access to them when you owned cable. And now we've said, we don't want to do cable anymore. We want to have all these streaming platforms. And you've watched... As the number of platforms has gone up, meaning things are on more things, that to have access to all the shows you want to watch, you're basically paying the same price for cable again. Yeah, right. It, it's, it seems um, bad. But like, first of all, it seems very difficult to compete against Netflix and Amazon for two different reasons. Amazon, uh, Amazon is Amazon. Yeah. So by, by getting a Prime membership, which gives you free two-day shipping and lets you partake in capitalism... <laughs> um, you you also get access to the streaming service, so that's just a huge advantage they have. And then Netflix, in addition to their, you know, Netflix only recently started doing their own content. At first, it was just like, oh, all the movies that you wanted to see. So they have that they have that advantage, uh, which also is an advantage that Amazon has, I suppose. Although it's not yeah. free. Um, so a- anyone coming into the market against that, they better like. You, all you have is your shows and it's like, right. yeah, you're not going to compete. You're not going to get my, you're not, I'm not going to stop paying for Amazon prime and give that $10 to ABC or whatever. So yeah. you really have to have a compelling product. And I just don't know if that's ever going to happen. And as a person who still pays for cable, um, I, I want to watch this, this star Trek show. It's an NBC show or ABC, whichever it is. It's one of the network shows in any other situation. It would be on the television on my cable and now because they're trying to push their own streaming platform, I, a a subscribing, paying cable customer, cannot watch the show. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I To reiterate, I think we were already past the point. Um, I don't know what's going to happen next, but yeah. I, I don't know if it's just going to be more and more streaming services. I mean, it looks like the, the, the people that are getting in into the game at this late point are people with such amazing amounts of capital that they they can potentially compete with these people i mean apple has yeah. more money than god yeah and that's why they're that's what they're, they recognize that in order to compete in this market we got to go all out so that's what they're doing they're they're i mean a steven spielberg show um getting getting a ron moore show like for the nerdy people that's pretty big deal <laughs> uh, damien yeah. chazelle is like the hot thing on hollywood right now so they're they're throwing out all the stops and of course disney has all their stuff that they're just going to rip from every other streaming platform and just dump on theirs and say, you want Disney, you come to Disney. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, it, it'll probably be successful, but it's like, yeah, as, as a consumer, you're just like, I can't, I can't, I can't do this anymore. It's too much. Yeah. Absolutely. So hooray Apple. I, I probably will really want to watch this M night Shyamalan series, but I do not want to pay $10 a month or whatever else they're going to charge. So I don't yeah. know if I ever will. Right. I'm sort of resigned to just not watching it, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's how I am. Sad. Like, yeah, I you're, you're absolutely right. that Star Trek Discovery is like the show you and I would be excited about watching. Like I, I could see an alternate universe where we're doing a podcast on an episode by episode recap of that Star Trek show. And yeah. and in this universe, we're not even watching it. Right. 
Yeah, no, I, I, if anything, I view not watching it as like a mild protest against this practice. <laughs> right. It's like, no, no. If you had put it on something that I could watch it, then then probably yes, but not, not this one. No, no. Yeah, I agree. All right. So last but not least, um, when everyone is listening to this podcast, Matt, the Oscars will be over. We will know who won all the awards, but we are in the past, technically. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I did not throw out my Oscar predictions on last week's podcast. I just I just forgot. So I thought it'd be fun to toss in some predictions right now. And everyone is listening to this could could then laugh at me because they know they know the the outcome because I've been proven to not be very good at this thing. (laughs) Well. Dramatic irony is one of the strong suits of our entire, you know, brand. So that's true. That's true. All right. So here, let's be dramatically ironic right now, yeah. um, and let's go through some of the big, the big categories. And I'll, I'll tell you who I who I think is going to win, but who I really wanted to win. Okay. Uh, so we'll go through these really quick. First, original screenplay. Um, I think Three Billboards is going to win this one. Um, I'm okay with that. But I really wanted Get Out to win. I think this is a really good opportunity to give Jordan Peele a, an Oscar because I don't think he's going to get one anywhere else. Well, I think the 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 movie might win some other ones, but it's not going to win any of the, the big categories, unfortunately. Um, so I would have liked to see Get Out. I, I like Three Billboards. I'm not part of the um, anti-Three Billboards thing that's happening right now. But mm-hmm. uh, but I, I I think Get Out is a, a probably a better movie. Okay. All right, adapted screenplay. Um, this is an interesting category. I think Call Me By Your Name is going to win, and I think it should win. Uh, this is the one that Logan was nominated, Matt, for um, for a, uh, an Oscar for writing, which has never oh. happened before in comic book history. Yeah, that also makes me, I'm like, I didn't even know Logan was adapted from anything. Well, I, yeah, that's I, that's interesting, right? Because I guess that because comic books exist, any writing award for a, a comic book movie will be from um like will be an adaption i guess is what they're saying i don't know i i, I don't know okay yeah uh, weird yeah this is a this is not a, a very powerful category like the, the nominees are call me by your name the disaster artist logan molly's game and mudbound mudbound is a very good movie i'd be happy if that one won as well but i think i think call me by your name is the best movie on this list so that's that Okay. Um, editing, best editing, which is a fun category because the only way you know about editing is if it's bad, kind of. <laughs> so the 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 Academy Award that wins the editing category is usually the flashiest one um, that does something weird with how the movies cut together, which is why I think Dunkirk will win because Dunkirk has the three different timelines things spliced together. Um, on that note, though, I think Baby Driver should win because it is a movie that is set to music, basically, and therefore the edits have to be in rhythm, and it's fantastic work, and I think any Edgar Wright movie should win for editing because it's, they're so so good. Yeah, that's generally true. I agree. Yeah. All right, cinematography. Um, I, think, I think it's finally Roger Deakins' time, Matt, after being nominated, I think, 11 times or something. I think he's going to finally win for Blade Runner 2049. And you know what? He damn well should, because that's a beautiful movie. Even if you don't like the plot, even if you don't like the characters, the movie is shot beautifully, and it deserves yeah. this award. Yeah, I think it should win everything for every <laughs> category. But yeah, I'm happy with it winning at least one. Yeah, I hope you're right about this. Yeah, I, I really do, too. Uh, supporting actress, I think uh, Allison Janney is going to win for her supporting role in I, Tanya. Um, I liked her in this movie a lot, but I want Laurie Metcalf to win. Uh, for Lady Bird, because I thought her performance was nuanced and, and challenging and wonderful and really important to the film. Whereas Alice and Jenny gave a good performance in I, Tanya, but it was not as important to a lot of the most dramatic moments of the film. But I think Alice and Jenny's going to win it. Okay. Oh, well. Supporting actor, I think Sam Rockwell is going to win for Three Billboards, um, which I, it's hard to, to disagree with because I think he does a really good job in this movie. But Matt... I want Willem Dafoe to win for Florida Project because I love that movie so much and it kind of got robbed at the Oscars. I think this is the only nomination for it, so I want it to win just so Florida Project wins an Oscar. So, mm. and Willem Dafoe is is incredible in it. Um he like has to play this like kind of no nonsense uh hotel manager who also still clearly has a, a lot of emotion and heart underneath it all as he's watching these families in these dead end situations that are basically 
leading to destruction and there's really nothing he can do about it okay well yeah i'm I can't really weigh in on that because i haven't seen either of these but uh that's uh, I can't, <laughs> this makes me look forward to seeing both of them frankly i think you're gonna love both these movies all right, Best Actress. Um, I think Frances McDormand is going to win for three billboards, and I think she should. Um, there, there's a lot of, like we talked about, there's a lot of divisive opinions of, of three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Um, some people hate it. Some people say it's racist. Some people say it's terrible. Um, but I think even the people that don't like this movie agree that Frances McDormand is the best part of it. She gives this wonderful performance. Um, it's It's dark. It's like she's, like the movie's about anger and misplaced anger. And she's mad. <laughs> she's really mad throughout this movie, and it shows. And like you can feel her pain behind that anger. Um, it's such a wonderful performance. Like I, I love Frances McDormand. I loved her in Fargo, which I think she won for Fargo, right? I'm pretty sure. Um, Sounds familiar. I think this is a better performance than Fargo, which is kind of crazy to see. Okay. But all right, cool. best actor. Um, I think unfortunately that uh, Gary Oldman is going to win this one for. Darkest Hour, which is actually the only um, the only film, the only Oscar film I have not seen, Darkest Hour. I was hoping to fit it in before the Oscars. It, it just didn't happen. But um, there's so many other good performances in this in this this category, though. Uh, Timothy Chalamet for Call Me By Your Name, Daniel Day-Lewis for Phantom Thread, Daniel Kaluuya for Get Out, and Denzel Washington in Roman J. Israel, Esquire, um, all of which I think are amazing performances it just, I guess, Matt, it just feels to me like that, that Gary Oldman's performance is very old Oscars. Like he's playing someone real. He put a bunch of makeup on and therefore he's going to win the award. And I, I, I had thought like the Oscars were trying to change and move away from that kind of thing, that, that the person who gives the, the loudest performance with the most makeup wins. And that's why I want someone else to win this one, but I doubt it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, just based on what you just said, I think you're probably correct. Uh, I, I just the fact that 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 performance has been advertised at me, and, and I haven't <laughs> really I haven't really heard any of the other ones you just mentioned, um, like, like touted. Um, mm-hmm. That kind of suggests that some energy is be- being put into, you know, campaigning for him winning that one. Yeah, yeah. All right. So now we are on to the last two best director. Um, I think. As we've talked about on this podcast before, I think this is basically Guillermo del Toro's to lose, and I think he is going to win it, and I think he should. But this is one of those ones that I would be absolutely happy with any of these nominees winning. We have Christopher Nolan for Dunkirk, Jordan Peele for Get Out, Greta Gerwig for Lady Bird, and Paul Thomas Anderson for Phantom Thread, as well as Guillermo. And I, I would any of these should win, like any of them. Yeah. But I think I think it's Guillermo's, and I think it's well deserved. Um, he is he made a, a beautiful movie, and he has had a wonderful career. And give him that Oscar. Do it. Yeah, it's it's nice that movies are still good. Cause <laughs> that's, I, I haven't seen most of those actually, but I'm, yeah. I'm, well, this is um, moving on to Best Picture. This is the lowest box office receipt of the Best Picture movies combined um, in years. So we're getting like there's this thing happening with the Oscars where the best movies are increasingly the ones that no one no one watches. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, which is unfortunate, but it's just kind of the way the way things are that we don't honor those big blockbusters, um, and, and a lot of times they don't they don't deserve it. So these are these are all better movies, and and this category there are nine movies in this category, Matt, and if, with the exception of Darkest Hour, which I can't comment on because I haven't seen, I would be happy with any of these winning, any of them. Um, but I think it's going to be The Shape of Water. I think it, that's kind of the 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 dialogue there. I think Get Out is probably going to be close behind it. And I think the, the the battle is kind of for second place between Get Out and Three Billboards with a lot of people, a lot of people liking Three Billboards, a lot of people campaigning against it because of their dislike for it, which I think is going to allow Shape of Water to, to land in there with the win. But cool. I thought La La Land was going to win last year, so what the hell do I know? <laughs> it's okay. So that is... You'll get there over time, Scott. Yeah, that is the Oscars. Um, you just listen to all that, and you know whether I was right or wrong. So um, you can laugh at me or say, "Wow, Scott, you did it!" Wow. Um, it'll probably wow. be it'll probably be the former. But the the ceremony was great, Matt. They made a lot of jokes about wrong envelopes and a yeah. lot of Trump jokes. Is great. Yeah, I enjoyed the performance. 
the performances. <laughs> the musical performance. Yeah, the was music great. was great. Oscars. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to be watching uh, Ant Lion during the Oscars. That's fair. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Hope everyone enjoyed it. <laughs> All right. That is it for the news this week. Let's move on to the main event. Let's talk about YouTube, Matt. Okay. Um, so as you said at the top of the episode, there is this... I, 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 it's weird to call it a pushback. Film Twitter is very vocal about certain things. And some of the things that Film Twitter is very vocal about is that YouTube and YouTube videos is like a plague on film theory and criticism and studies, um, which is... I, <laughs> It's ridiculous, Matt. It's totally ridiculous. And it's ridiculous for a lot of reasons. Like, uh, YouTube is this thing where anyone can make a YouTube channel. I mean, we did it. You just you just sit in front of a computer and click create channel. So right. there's this this like implied lack of authority when whenever you when whenever the barrier of entry to something is so low that there's this implied lack of authority because anyone can get on it and talk. Like if you're reading a critic in a newspaper, that critic has a certain amount of implied authority because he's been hired by the newspaper. If you're reading a critic on the Hollywood reporter or Roger or IndieWire or any of other of these sites, they are a paid employee of the site that is hired presumably for their skill in reviewing movies and therefore um, have implied authority that they know what the hell they're talking about. YouTube doesn't have any of that. There just doesn't. Yeah. And it's just individuals who think that they have something to say, um, right. and which is strikes me as being very democratic and um, the the sort of situation where the cream rises to the top. Yeah, which which I think I would make a strong case that is true, and that is that is indeed what has happened in one sense or another. Right. Um, I think that like the strongest case you could make against it is like. Oh, the, the the channels that do really well are not the deepest, most incisive ones. And I would say, yeah, but that's true for everything. Right. Like we just it, said that blockbuster films don't get nominated for awards. I mean, we like right. that's it's kind of the same thing. Right. Like like you're you're going to make a like what what YouTube has done is it, it has made a certain depth of film criticism accessible, widely accessible. And so so I think probably the best channel to open up with is actually the first one on the list, which do you want to, do you want to start in with that? Cause yeah, let's do it. Th this to me typifies both what is, what is good about YouTube film criticism and also a little bit of what people are complaining about, but I, I'm still going to defend it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. So let's talk about, yeah, what, what we've done is I basically written down, um, I guess this is going to be kind of a recommendations podcast a little bit, Matt. I think we're going to dive into these pretty in, in a lot of depth as well, but we're also basically saying if YouTube is this democratic thing where where authority has to be granted democratically, here's the ones that we think are the best. And right. we're going to start with what I would not call my favorite YouTuber, but one that I've probably been following the longest out of all these, which is Red Letter Media. Yeah. And so, so to clarify what I meant, like the I, I I genuinely think that the red letter media plinket reviews where he does the in character uh comedic reviews of the of the star wars prequels actually spread many ideas about proper s storytelling character filmmaking to a much better audience than they had been re ever ever received by i mean I, it, it's kind of like we, almost weird or embarrassing to admit at this point for some reason but I'm pretty sure you and I like learned a lot from those the first time we saw them. And this was years ago. And, and now people can have conversations about about the importance of establishing a character that like you couldn't have had those conversations before because there wasn't this common language of like, oh, yeah, everyone's watched the Red Letter Media reviews. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that they did a lot to um, to actually move like to, to raise the level of discussion of film criticism. Yeah. And I think, you know, I can't remember exactly when these came out, but I know they were not even on YouTube at first, right? Like it was on an, another streaming platform. So this was prior to YouTube really becoming the dominant video hosting platform of the internet. Um, and I remember they were broken into parts because places still had time limits on their videos. <laughs> Like when YouTube right, first yeah. came out, if you weren't a partner, you got 10 minutes and that's it. You got a 10 minute video. 
Um, and these were feature length reviews. They basically as long as the movies themselves. And I, I really do think that red letter media set did set the bar. They, they, there might be, have been video film studies type stuff that existed before they did their star Wars reviews, but I don't know of it. And in all my research, I haven't fi- found anyone that started prior to them. So, um, I mean, you have the, the channel awesome guys, the nostalgia critic types, but they were doing something very different. Um, and, and maybe we'll get into talking about them in a bit and my, my problems with, with that. But yeah, I mean like red letter media appeals to us and those star wars reviews appeals to us because we like story structure and this in-depth exploration of how to tell a story and what those review what those reviews focused on was the story it was not it was less about i mean they did still do stuff about the the camera work and special effects and stuff but the real meat of what those guys wanted to talk about was the, the story and that's what they did right so yeah like right now red letter media is mainly doing their half in the bag show and a few other shows And, you know, sometimes the half in the bag shows are just these guys. They've just gone to see a movie. They haven't really had a lot of time to think about it necessarily. And they're just saying they're like their first impressions. And that's not without value, but it's also not um, the pinnacle of what you can get from criticism. Obviously, sometimes you just want to know if a movie is okay, you know, And, and, and then it's it's actually valuable and entertaining to get their to get their take on it. Yeah, Um, I don't I don't think they're somehow like watering down and, and destroying the art of film criticism by doing what they're doing though. That, yeah. That, that's, I, I still appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I liken their half in the bag stuff to what we do on our review podcasts. I mean, like I, I prep, like I sit and think about what I want to say about this movie before we start hitting record, but I'm not writing out a script. We don't, we don't have a, 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 a fully made out plan of exactly what we're going to talk about from A to Z. This is not a video essay. Um, and that's, that's not what red letter media is doing either. So I I think a lot of people see those half in the bag things and and they compare them to like a a fully formed out, like written essay or written criticism. And they're really not comparable and 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 they they don't, they don't want to be right. Yeah. Most of these channels we're talking about today are more like the video essay form. Um, yeah. And that is not to say that I don't have my criticisms of red letter media, um, I think when they did their Plinket, The Force Awakens review, um, they were like, they, they focused the review around ragging on Disney for taking this thing and just commercializing the shit out of it. And as as part of that criticism, they decided that diversifying the cast was just a cynical corporate cash grab thing, which, yeah, it it was. Like, the reason Disney put a black guy and a woman in this movie is to... Um, get money from the woke crowd, I guess. But as we talked about a little with the, the the Black Panther review, there's still value to that. Like there's still children and and adults that are going to see people that look like them on the screen, and that is important whether or not it's a cynical corporate mandated thing or not. Um, and I mean, there's some there's sometimes these guys when I. I remember that they're just like three white guys from middle America and <laughs> they, yeah. they're decidedly unwoke, um, at times. <laughs> and yeah, some, some of their stuff true. is cringe worthy at times. Like when they went on like a five minute making fun of Gugu M- Mabatha Ra's name, yeah. like, that's not a good look guys. That's not, yeah. that's not, it's not a good call. Um, right. but I, I do, I do think there are things that they do that completely outweigh those negative sides. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think I think the the especially like half in the bag, I would say is OK. But I, I think I really do think that their Star Wars con their Star Wars um, long form reviews kind of invented the video essay genre. Or if they didn't invent it, at least it was one of the first massively popular examples of it that. Yeah, that that spread it around and, and inspired a lot of people. I think they defined the format more than mm-hmm. anything else did. Which is, yeah. I think, unfortunate in some cases where some of these essays, like that was, the, uh, they were very long reviews, and I think that's okay, but I think that means that a lot of people looking at video essays and and making them and copying what Red Letter Media did decided we can talk for an hour when there's there's times when I just want to come in with an editing brush and be like, guys, you need to, you can cut this, you can cut this. Um, yeah, the, I I think unless you have very something very specific to say that's going to go on for an hour and a half 
like 30, 30 minutes should be your goal. <laughs> 15 right. minutes is probably the best. Um, unless you're like it, and that all depends on what you're trying to do. Yeah. I, I will say another thing about the, uh, the Plinkit reviews specifically is that they're pretty funny. And e- even some of the other reviewers we're going to talk about today who I like, they're just not funny even when they're trying to be. Yeah. And that's a big yeah. problem when your review runs an hour. It's like, uh, oh man. <laughs> yeah. So. No, I, I completely agree. So let's move on. Yeah. Uh, th- I guess the only other thing we can talk about with Red Letter Media is their the best of the worst thing, which is probably my least favorite of the things that they do. Yeah, I don't is, even really watch those. I, I don't either. Those are long form, hour and a half long videos where they just watch bad movies and trash on them. And they can be funny, but I don't know. That's not uh, it's not the best for me. Yeah, I, I, I get enough Rich Evans laugh through the other content. So. <laughs> oh, we didn't even we got to talk about the, the nerd cast. That's the best thing that they oh. do. Yeah, that's true. Which which is really not even about. It's not even a film thing. It's no. just a c- culture. It's like just making fun of the the way the culture has transformed yeah. in, into this. Well, and it's and that's the thing about YouTube is that, like we we we're, we're you and I are putting in this in a big umbrella. We're saying this is talking about film on YouTube, but there's so many different things you can do. You can talk about film in the context of pop culture. You can talk about really getting into film studies. Like you can do gender studies and and all these things within the world of film. You can do essays talking about lighting or talking about writing or talking about direction. Um, There's so many different facets to talking about film via a video method, which is, which is kind of why I get so annoyed when people write it off whole cloth because they see someone like red letter media doing um, best of the worst and say, well, that's boring. I don't like that. And I was like, well, that's one tiny little corner of the internet. Like even red letter media is a pretty big company now but th- it's not the everything at all no 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 and yeah we got plenty of other examples of, of great stuff people right. can look at right um which moves us on now to our next thing which is every frame a painting the the tony zoo um incredibly popular uh, video essayist who sadly um does not make videos anymore matt yeah He's, he yeah. he announced that he was done with it I think in December, but it had been months and years bef- since his last video anyway. So everyone knew it, but he made it official back in December. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I guess his life just moved on from. Yeah. He's doing other projects. I mean, he was always yeah. very much the few and far between to like, he, he did not have a schedule. This was not a, I, a video a week guy. This was not a video a month guy. This was when I have something to say, I'm going to write it down and then I'm going to film it and I'm going to share it with you guys. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the, so the style of, of his essays tended to be very much focused on like picking one fairly narrow topic and then picking one, you know, usually, I'm going to say usually, even though I'm not 100% sure, picking like one movie to exemplify that idea mm-hmm. and and making making it very visual, sort of showing you visually what he's talking about while he describes it. Yeah. Um, you really walk away from these video essays with a, feeling like you've learned something and i think that's great and i think he he focuses very much on on direction and camera work and how how you can use the camera to convey certain emotions um and these are to me probably the most educational um about about like about pure filmmaking right because the first one i that pops into my head is the edgar wright episode which he Mm -hmm. just explained exactly how edgar wright correctly does visual comedy and how he uses not just the the actors but the camera and the cuts and the moves um and the pans to make things funny and like uh, there's the interesting thing with video content on youtube is there's some people that just stand in front of a green screen and talk they just have written a review down and stand in front of a green screen and talk and then they'll cut away to uh scenes from the movie at times which i think is okay uh, that's what Red Letter Media does. That's what some of the other people we're going to talk about doing. But I feel like channels like Every Frame of Painting really used the video essay medium to the best of its ability. So yeah. if we're talking about 
um, how did Akira Kurosawa compose movement in his movies, which is one of one of every frame of paintings essays, we cut two examples. We can show you. I'm talking, here's this thing that he did, and here's an example literally showing you how he did it. Here's how Edgar Wright does visual comedy. Here's how the Coen brothers take shot and reverse shot and do something interesting with it that's that's better than how we see it in other places. And yeah. that's why their videos are so much more engaging to me because a lot of this other stuff that I listen to, I'll have it on in the background and I'll be listening to them, but I won't be yeah. watching as much. Exactly. I was just going to say some of these I treat like a podcast. I, I don't even feel a need to look at the screen, but like, you know, another honorable mention for every frame of painting, the one about Jackie Chan and how to do action comedy. It's like you, there's, it's almost all visual. You know, he's, he's drawing your attention to visual things and then right. you see them and you're like, Oh, I see. You know, yeah. That, I get that. Yeah. 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 And it's, to his credit, these videos are eight to 12 minutes long. Um, mm-hmm. they get in, they get out, they show you, they, they're very focused. It's a very narrow scope. We want to show you this one thing. We want to show you this filmmaker and this thing, and then, uh, we'll, we'll get out and you get to go on with your life, which I think is, is probably one of the best ways to do it. Um, it's hard to think of another essayist on this list that I like better than Tony Zhu, which is why I was pretty, pretty devastated when he said he was going to stop. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I kind of admire even the willingness to stop like, right. because if you're just like, look, I can't do, I can't do what I was doing before. Like maybe he could continue to try and just not do a good job. And, and yeah. that's not, that's not good either. So. Right. I mean, there's like, uh, there, there comes to be a time when if you, if you are, if you have decided that you are going to be a full-time film YouTuber, that you have to do one episode a week or one episode a month. So even if you don't feel like you have something to say, you have to put out an episode. And that is when some of it can feel a little, uh, maybe contrived is the wrong word, but less interesting, less Worst. focused. So some of them can feel forced. Like, yeah, yeah, I think that's like, the right like word. A movie, a movie comes out and you kind of have something to say about it, but it, it's questionable whether if if you had your druthers, would you have actually bothered yeah. with, with making this? Right. Uh, you kind of have to. Right, and that's, I mean, and that I think is, if if we're looking at the difference between traditional written word criticism at a newspaper or a website and YouTube is that, if if a movie comes out that everyone wants to see, but you, critic A, don't have anything to say about it, then your website or your newspaper will just assign a different critic to it. When it's a YouTube page, it's just you. And if you don't have anything to say, then you don't put up a video. And then uh, you you lose on potential revenue because this is a big movie that people want to talk about. And I think that's why we try to to mix up our podcast like I, i'm relating a lot of this back to podcasting um mm-hmm. because i think it is similar at one's audio one's video but it is kind of a similar thing where we're kind of on our own just doing this thing and I, that's why I, I reach out to to people that that guest all the time to say do you have something specific to say about this movie great come on the air if you don't 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 come because yeah. you, you shouldn't have to we shouldn't have to force you to have an opinion about something you don't have but if you are person a that this is your full-time job and and that's it then you feel like you have to put a video up and i think we haven't gotten a nerd writer yet but when we get to nerd writer i think that's one of nerd writer's biggest problems um, okay. but we'll, we'll get there yeah yeah let's move on this next one i think i've watched maybe like one of hers so i have very little to say so why don't you describe yeah so this is Lindsay ellis who is probably um my favorite working video essayist um, because Tony Zhu and Every Frame of Painting is no no more. Lindsay Ellis um, originally started on Channel Awesome uh, with Nostalgia Critic. She was the nostalgia chick who was brought on to be a girl and review girly movies. And it's funny you go back and look at those old video essays that she did and those reviews, and and you can tell like she probably wasn't too happy with the format that's like we need a girl to review girly things or else we can't have an opinion on them and and Lindsay ellis is a very progressive feminist person and i'm sure that drove her crazy so eventually she uh left there and started her own thing and has slowly kind of been ramping up this regular film essay type content um the, my favorite thing that she's doing right now, Matt, which you will not be surprised about at all, is she's 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 exploring film studies as a whole, like as a 
a type of, of film discussion is the idea of film studies in general and then diving into different areas of film studies, like to talk about auteur theory, um, feminist theory, and all uh, different things. But she's using Transformers as the backdrop for that discussion. <laughs> Amazing. And it is so good. Um, she hasn't done one in a while, but I think there's six videos in the series at this point. And it's really it's really quite incredible um, because you have the, the contrast of talking about these deep intellectual film theory discussions discussions and then putting them in the lens of this Michael Bay um, mess tone, weird, sexist movie thing. And I think that th- that idea works so well. It's called The Whole Plate. Watch them all. It's, it's so good. Um, which yeah. which one of Lindsay's videos have you watched? Um. I completely blanking on this. It was a recent, it was a very recent one. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I, 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 let me, I I could look it up, but, uh, okay. No. Well, she, I mean, like recently she's done one about bright. She did a 45 minute video examining exactly why bright is a terrible movie. Um, and I like when I think of videos that earn, their uh length i think her bright bad one is is one of them um, i believe that was the one that i watched yeah okay great great um but she's done she did this whole one exploring uh the hunchback of notre dame and from disney's version to the original version and exploring the differences between them and how those differences came about um she she apologized to stephanie mayer for for twilight for hating her um which is a a fascinating one um one of my favorites is her guardians of the galaxy 2 video um she also did one on on mel brooks and how 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 to do satire correctly basically like and using mel brooks as an example and I, i just I just find her videos fascinating. Um, they are they are not as as visually appealing as every frame of painting is. I think she uses the visual medium better than just a talking head in front of a screen, but it does divert back to that a lot of the time. Um, but she's she's great, and I wish she was more popular. She, I mean, she's doing she's not she's not aching for views, but um, I think she should be far more popular than she is. Cool. Yeah, a lot of those sound appealing to me. I think uh, I just need to look through her backlog and find yeah. some stuff. And I'll probably get hooked. Yeah, she likes to write about Disney a lot. So she did one called Are, the, Are Disney Villains Going Extinct, Matt? Which I think will pay off uh, <laughs> to you specifically because you wrote that whole article about how we don't let our Disney movies or movies villains be villains anymore. Yeah, right. We try to make them complex and not yeah. just joyfully evil. I wrote a whole <laughs> essay about this. Yeah, yeah. So I think you'll that that one will appeal to you as well. Um, but yeah, Lindsay's great. She's she's doing uh, they're doing a Hobbit series, Matt, and she's flying to New Zealand to film part of it, which is <laughs> crazy. Um, That's so funny. Yeah, I thought yeah. I saw a tweet about that. That I'm, I'm kind of like, why? But okay, fine. Well, sure. they, they did the same thing um, with her Hunchback of Notre Dame video they were in in paris in front of in front of notre dame um and i mean it was cool to see her at i don't i don't necessarily know video wise why she had to do that so i'm interesting to see what she does with hobbit because new zealand is way further away than france um but i think it's cool that she's successful enough to where she can like hire a crew and do those kind of things um that's great yeah no i mean if i were her i would just use it as an excuse to you know, expense, uh, flight to New Zealand as a business expense. (laughs) Right. Right. But this is why this is, I mean, like I think of Lindsay Ellis and I think of people complaining about YouTube and and the legitimacy of, of film criticism on YouTube. This is the person teaching people film theories. I mean, teaching people what film studies are. And she, I mean, we, we did a whole thing about the three act structure, Matt, and a lot of what I originally learned about the the complicated nature and the ins and outs of the three act structure back in the day was through a Lindsay Ellis video about the three act structure. So, I mean, these are like, you can go on the internet right now and learn about the male gaze as it works in actual feminist theory in like, like a, like a school lecture. Like, and that's, that's how it is done. And of course she uses transformers for it because that's what she's doing but i think that's remarkable and i think that should be celebrated i wonder if some of this um sort of feeling that that people need to tear down youtube reviews is is that 
people want their expertise to be sort of walled in um, in the same way that a someone talking a lot about like physics or whatever will tend to be regarded as a crackpot unless they are credentialed in physics in some way. Um, people prefer, and by people, I generally mean people who have an education, like an official credential in film studies, would prefer to have monopoly on that and not have um, people running their mouth about film criticism if they don't have the credential. And I, yeah. I don't really like that, actually, because I like the idea that we can learn, you know, you can learn physics online, you can learn about film criticism online. That's that's fine. Um there is value to getting a credentialed education in physics, sure, but I'm pretty sure you can learn a full bachelor's worth of of physics content on you know YouTube now, right. or if not just YouTube, then then YouTube plus textbooks. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, and it's it's an idea of like, I guess what do you what do you want out of it? Like, w- w- would it be would you learn more in a, a college level course than what Lindsay Ellis will teach you? Yeah, probably, but. I can't go to college. <laughs> like well, I, I didn't, I didn't like, I missed the boat on studying film in, in college. Like I missed, I missed that train and yeah. I don't have the money or the time to, to hop back on it. So this is, this is an alternate education way where you can actually learn things. And I think that's really cool. I mean, I'm not even entirely sold on the idea that you learn that you would learn more by going to, yeah, I well, mean, like, like, like maybe you learn more by going to a full four year degree program than you would from <laughs> Lindsay Ellis's channel, but that's a ridiculous comparison to make. Yeah, that's true. That's like true. The, the, the actual educational density of a four year degree is incredibly low relative to the educational density of a given minute of any of these essays we're talking about today. That's yeah, that's fair. Um, and I like to, to credential you, Matt, you've been through a PhD program, so you've done about as much school as there is possible to do. Right. And I can tell you that the <laughs> educational density is very low. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. OK. Um, so that's Lindsay Ellis. Um, I, I'm i trying to remember. We're going to put I guess we should say we're going to put every single one of these YouTube channels uh, in the show notes. We're going to put a link to them. So if you listen to anything that sounds appealing to you and want to subscribe and start supporting these people, that's how you do it. Yeah. So um, let's move on, Matt, yeah. to the next one. So the next one is uh, Filmjoy is the, I guess, the company name, and it used to be called Movies with Mikey. Yeah. Um, and and Mikey is a dude who makes basically, I hesitate to call them just a film review because it's more like individual film love letters to, to films, but he does tend to focus on just one film yeah. at a time. Um, so, you know, if you look through his videos, the you know the titles of the videos will be movie names, and he'll talk about what's great about a movie. Um, yeah, it's, it's usually more interesting. It, it's usually not just like a review. It's not just like, no, these are some good things about it. Four out of five stars. It's, it's more like, um, some thesis. They're essays in the sense that he, he has a thesis going into it. Um, something specific about that movie that he wants to highlight and, and sell as being important. Yeah. And, it, and they are usually re- relentlessly positive. I mean, that's why he named the company Film Joy, is mm. that he believes in positivity. Um, this guy is Mikey Newman. He lives in, in my neck of the woods. I want to be best friends with him. But um, <laughs> he he wants to talk about the things we love in media. So he put up a movie about freaking um, um, Pearl Harbor. And which is not a good movie, but by the end of his 15 minute essay, you'll be like, okay, yeah, there was good parts in that. And then you're like, whoa, what just happened? And I think that's what he really excels at is like he did his most popular video is about the force awakens, which is, and which is basically just a love letter to all the things that he thought were amazing about this movie. And it makes you appreciate it. And, and the, the cynical side of you kind of gets beaten down by this relentless positivity a little bit. And you find yourself, I don't know, a, a happier person overall, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's that's fair. He's it, it, it's so easy to be negative when criticizing. Yeah. Um, but criticism does not necessarily at all mean negative criticism. And what he's doing is almost always um, is explaining why something is awesome in some way, usually in some way you hadn't thought of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the when any video essay like. I, I want to learn something new. I don't want my opinion reinforced. So the, the things I like the most is when someone says something and I'm like, huh, 
I never thought of it that way before. And you you did such a good job of explaining it that I see what you're saying. Like he he did his John Wick episode is all about how John Wick is Mount Olympus basically, and that is yeah. that is the story is is um, someone taking down the gods on Mount Olympus. And while I, I saw some of the imagery in that the first time I saw it, I really hadn't parsed it in that level of detail before. And his video made me look at the movie that way, and I it made me like it more. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's. That's great, and I think that's needed sometimes. I don't think you're going to see, unlike Lindsay, he's not going to dive into technical um, storytelling and movie creation and directing and cinematography and things like that. But he is just has a point of view, and he wants to share his point of view. Yeah, I would say his is one where it is more like an essay being read over film clips from the movie. Yes, that is absolutely Um, what it is, yeah. But but it actually benefits still because, you know, it, I don't know. I, I think I've just lost the ability to read over the years. And, uh, <laughs> it, and he has a very kind of uh, usually kind of a vocal delivery style that I like. So. Yeah, I mean, it, you can his passion comes through. Um, mm-hmm. He has a way of like hitting emotional beats in a way like a good way where you get sad when he wants you to get sad and you're in awe when he wants you to be in awe. And he's very good at that kind of delivery. And he's yeah. funny, too, which helps. He is he is pretty funny. I frequently yeah, I, laugh. I, I agree. Like his his jokes are um, more sort of just his sense of humor r- rather than like red letter media jokes are usually some nice, nice uh, burn on the movie. Whereas <laughs> like his jokes are more just like quirky centered around the format of the show. Yeah. Jokes. Yeah. Does that makes sense. Yeah. Completely agree. And he's trying something new this year, which I find pretty fascinating. Um, he did a, a two video series about called How We See Star Wars, which is basically just a very long um, collection of what critics and fans thought of Star Wars throughout the time of, of the movies, like what the, what the initial reaction was when each individual movie came out and how that reaction has changed over time. I thought that was a, a, a great, really interesting thing that I know something I, I thought about, especially around the backlash to to. Um, the last Jedi I thought about, I wonder, I wonder what people thought about these movies back in the day, but he actually took the time to gather the information and, and display it. And I yeah. thought that was a great series. It was almost a work of like journalism. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, so that, that was, I agree. Those were great. And I saw him complaining that no one watched them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which was a bit, a bit sad. Cause, um, I mean, I, I watched them. I thought they were great, but I, I can sort of see why they would be less intrinsically viral than yeah, like then so-and-so shits on an, on a movie that you liked. You yeah. Know? Yeah. We'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. all right. So I wanted to move on now to, I, I put, I put Jenny Nicholson on this list, Matt, and I don't have a lot to say about Jenny Nicholson other than I think she's hilarious and, this is a whole different kind of format of video than everything we've talked before. This is Jenny sits on a bed and says funny things about movies. And that's really it. She's almost just a vlogger. Like she's just a vlogger who talks about movies sometimes. Yeah. But uh, which is fine. (laughs) I mean, like I think that my first experience to her was her suicide squad video. I don't know when you jumped on this train, but I thought that was hilarious that her way of like breaking down incisively and getting to the root of why like it's almost reverse movies with Mikey because she gets to the root of why bad things are bad <laughs> really yeah. in in the most hilarious manner. Yeah. Well, it, it, she's just really entertaining. And that's yeah. one thing that like set, setting aside the like cerebral insight value of a lot of these channels, Jenny Nicholson, like frankly, probably puts in a lot less time into making her product than mm-hmm. most of these people. But but hers are very entertaining just because she's a funny person yeah yeah it's and that is that is something like i didn't subscribe to every frame of painting because i liked tony zoo's personality Mm -hmm. Uh, i subscribed to jenny nicholson because i like jenny nicholson's personality i subscribed to red letter media because i like these guys personality and and it's just what your goal is for each of these different type of videos right um, yeah, and I think that's something that, that and that's why she's seen success is because she has this very quirky, interesting sense of humor, this interesting way of, of looking at the world. And that comes across really well in these these short videos where she's just going to town on stuff. Yeah, I agree. Like, like the the 10 worst reasons why you didn't like The Last Jedi. <laughs> was yeah. So, so great. I love that. Yeah, that, that was a really good one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah so the next one um, we want to talk about is Lessons from a Screenplay. Sorry, I need to enunciate lessons from the screenplay. 
And this channel, as as the as it says on the tin, uh, focuses more on the actual sort of narrative content that you would that you would get from the screenplay. And I like that because I that is sort of how I tend to think about things. I tend to think of them in terms of the story and what's actually on the page. Um, this is one of those ones where once you discover it, if it's your bag, you just sort of binge um, all of them. Right. And uh, I, I, in fact, what's funny about these is they come out relatively infrequently. So despite the fact that I know that I love this channel, I don't think I've watched it in a while, even though I just like when I found it, I just watched everything mm-hmm. on the channel. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it is there. There is something to like this guy. Um, his name is Michael. I'm not sure what his last name is, but he kind of realized like the, I think the most successful channels in the space realize that there's a market that is not filled. Um, there's a lot of people that talk about movies on YouTube, but there is there are not a lot of people that talk about movies from the sp- specific point of the screenplay. And he, he saw that and then just said, I'm going to play in that space because I have something to say there. And yeah, I mean, as, as people that love story itself and, and, and we both love movies, but as we love, like I, I do listen back to our podcast sometime and realize that what you and I spend the most time talking about when we're reviewing a movie is the story. Um, that's what we really get into. Like we spend a lot less time on the actual filmmaking and a lot more time on how the story played out over the course of the film. And so it, it doesn't surprise me that either of us really like this channel that focuses on the screenplay and the story. Yeah, I don't even have any honorable mention episodes other than that I, I love these videos. And, and mm-hmm. I, I, if I recall, they're pretty short, right? They so, are. Yeah, they're all less than they're about 12 to 15 minutes, depending on yeah. the, the subject. Yeah. yeah, so very, very bingeable channel. So I recommend that. Yeah, absolutely. And and that I think it's cool that he, again, uses the video medium to its full effect by like, taking scenes he takes the actual screenplay and superimposes it on the video and will actually show the the writing of the screenplay to enforce his points as well as showing the scene as it's played out in the the finished product and i think that's cool um i also think it's fun to see that sometimes because if you don't read a lot of screenplays you see how you kind of see in real time how the dialogue changed from the way it was written to the way it was actually performed and i think that's always fun to see yeah, yeah, no, that, that that is another fun thing that that you really don't see anywhere else, frankly. Yeah, and he he does kind of cool mashups sometimes. Like he did uh, Whiplash versus the Black Swan, which was a video that I like. He he combines these movies in ways that I didn't think you would, but uh, it, he called it the the Anatomy of the Obsessed Artist, which is one of my favorites of his. If you haven't gotten a chance to see that one, check that out. Okay, cool. Are, I think I did, but yeah. I might watch it again. Sometime. And then he did uh, Logan. And Children of Men, which okay. is another yeah. thing I didn't necessarily think of, of of teaming up into a video series. But yeah, I mean, usually he's picking some point that he's sort of underlining through either comparison or contrast with the two movies. Right. Right. And that's what he does for all of them. Right. It's like I am yeah. not just going to talk about Get Out. His newest his newest video is about Get Out. But he's not just going to say, let's just talk about the screenplay of Get Out. He's saying I have a specific perspective on the screenplay that I want to talk about, like get out was a new perspective in horror. Um, his one on girl with the dragon tattoo is breaking convention. So he talks about how that movie took the normal act structure and said, screw you. We're not doing that. And so, yeah, there's a, it's not just, this is a movie. Let's talk about the screenplay. It's let's talk about a certain aspect of it. And I think, I think that kind of focus helps your videos not get 30 minutes long and helps like it's an essay, right? You have a, a main, theme of your essay you have a main idea and you're going to explore that throughout the essay yeah right right all right so next we move into movie bob and you and i have talked about movie bob before i don't know if we've talked about him on air before but we have mixed opinions of movie bob um he yeah. does he does weekly reviews of all the new movies for geek.com but he also has his own independent channel um where he does long form video essay type things. Um, so he does uh, really that bad or actually I think is really that good was the original series. He just did a really that bad for Batman vs Superman. So he has really that good, which is just exploring movies that everyone thinks are good, but no one's taken the time in a while to actually examine. Is it, is it, is it as good as we, as we remember it being? And his argument is, yeah. Um, yeah. So what did you, what, what, is, what do you think of a movie, Bob? 
I think I liked the really that good um, essays a lot, and I found much less value in the really that bad, which which is uh, probably a bit telling. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's way more fun to listen to someone talk about why they love something than to rag on it, especially because the really that bad one about Justice League or, or um, whichever whichever one of the DC movies it was, <laughs> it just kind of it was like incredibly long. Yeah, he went I, a little I, overboard. Yeah, I don't think it needed to be that long at all. Like there were just whole sections where I'm just like, that's either not original or it's just kind of, uh, there's just no value there. It's, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. I, like you just stop paying attention to it at some point. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Like that's, that's kind of the worst I can say about it. I mean, I guess if I, 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 I definitely recommend movie, movie about less than a lot of the other ones on this list, but, but I did, I did really enjoy the specifically the really that good videos. And I, I do recommend those. I think he does a thing where he turns up the tempo of his voice. Like, you know, we listen to podcasts on one and a half speed. Mm-hmm. I think he does that to his voice by default because mm-hmm. he talks really fast in his videos. And I don't think that's his natural speaking voice. And it doesn't bother me as much because I'm used to listening to content at a faster speed on in, in podcast form. But I can see why some people would have a problem with how fast he moves through these things, especially when it's an hour long movie or video. Yeah. I mean, not to go too far down that rabbit hole, but like, even when you speed up my voice on a podcast, you're listening to me speaking in a relaxed way, but sped up. Whereas when movie about talks, he's talking really fast, and with <laughs> like, like a lot of tension in his voice. And it's kind of, it's like agitating to listen to someone talk like this for a really long time. Yeah. Cause you're just like, Oh my God, relax. Yeah. Yeah. So. Just, just, just take it down a little bit. Just yeah. take it down. Agreed. Let's enjoy yeah. it. Let's let's be enveloped in the film. But but I do I do really like the content. Um, I think he's really that good over Superman. The original Superman was great um, when he dove into the Spider-Man films. I really loved that, too. Um, and yeah. I think there's some there's definitely some value to his content. Um, I, I don't do you listen to his geek dot com video reviews, the ones that come out each week? I didn't even know that was a thing, honestly. Yeah, he does like 10 minute video reviews. um on on the geek.com YouTube channel. But cool. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're okay. I, I <laughs> like, I, I partially wish he would just write them down maybe. And ma- mm-hmm. maybe he does. I'm not sure. He doesn't advertise if he writes them down. Um, but okay. that's movie Bob. I don't know if we have anything else to say about, about him. Not really? No. Um, but a, a, a friend of the podcast, uh, is, is friends with Bob. So yeah. DD <laughs> who has been on our, our Kryptonian collection episode and, uh, uh, Phantom Zoned before. He's friends with Bob. So maybe yeah. we'll get Bob on here one day. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be great. I'm interested. He, I think as much as we we talk about his his way of talking, I think he does have very interesting, complex opinions of films. Um, so yeah. that's why I, I do listen to his weekly reviews because I think he does, he he has a perspective that I don't see as often. No, yeah. I, I, I guess we were mild, mildly negative there, but yeah, I do yeah. I do recommend the just probably just not the justice league one if you're going to yeah. start somewhere on bob yeah that's yeah fair he didn't like spider-man homecoming and that apparently people rioted when he said it was just fine <laughs> yeah i mean i also thought it was just fine i guess oh so. you, you ended up seeing that i don't remember if you ever talked about I that did, yeah yeah i don't know if we i mean i don't think i had much to say about it so. all right all right so okay let's let's get a little more negative now <laughs> let's head let's head <laughs> into the the negative zone okay um let's talk about nerd writer a bit uh, nerd writer is one that you don't know a lot about um yeah i think just because like i've I've watched a couple of them and i just they didn't hook me so i didn't watch anymore which is yeah yeah so. and so nerd writer is one out of all of these out of most of these nerd writer is one that has a weekly show that he mm-hmm. it is a it is a weekly video essay series rain or shine He's going to put out an essay. And like we were talking about before, there are times that means when I just think the quality is not, it's not very good. There's, there's times when I need an essay idea this week and I don't know what to do. And so I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it. Um, But there's times also when I think he does very fascinating things and Mm. I really enjoy his videos. And I think, I think they're very hit or miss. And he did one um, like four weeks ago about Spielberg and sound design and, and the idea of seeing with your ears and it, it used the movie Munich to kind of show how Spielberg uses sound and how movies use sound. And I, I don't think like, 
I think a lot of nerd writers topics are not overly complicated. Like it's, it's things that you probably already know about the film. Um, but he, he, he tends to do it in a way that I think is, is very well, uh, shown, but, Mm -hmm. but yeah, I think, I think the, the, I have to do this every week. Nature of it really does hurt him at times. Can I just ask, like, is, is it funny at all? No, no. Yeah. So the reason I ask that is like, I was thinking about, about half in the bag to, to draw everything into a big circle Mm -hmm. and how, how very often, like, like a given episode of half in the bag will have essentially zero in the way of like insight. Like I won't walk away from it thinking I learned something about movies or story or acting or anything really. But I watched it anyway because I enjoy the personalities and usually get like at least one decent laugh. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have to have something that makes people come back. And if, if you're just sort of a inconsistent podcast, uh, 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 channel that, that covers, um, that tries to be insightful, but isn't always, then that's just like, you're not going to, you're not going to, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not going to keep coming back, honestly. I mean, and I, I just opened his channel right now looking at it and out of all of these, I I watch maybe one or two of these a month. <laughs> like you see little spaces where, and, and that's because like, he doesn't just do a movie stuff too. He does, he does other things too. Like this week's one was about a painting that really disturbed him. Um, he did one about fidget spinners. Um, so, yeah. so it, it's really hit or miss for me. And I think one of my favorite ones he did actually was where he took the movie passengers with a, um, Jennifer Lawrence and why am I not Chris? Chris no. One of the Chris's, the, the, the Jurassic Park Pratt, Chris, Chris Pratt. Pratt. There you go. Um, and he basically said, here's how you would make this movie so much better by just rearranging stuff and telling the movie from Jennifer Lawrence's perspective instead of Chris's Chris Pratt's. And I thought that was probably one of his better essays because that was very interesting. And he actually took the time to re-edit scenes from the movie to show that, to, to, to literally show how that would look. And That's I thought cool. that was really well done. I like but. that idea. I mean, there's something to be, it, it's worth pointing out, I think, that that YouTube is this really quite new and incredibly flexible and powerful thing. And, yeah. and, I, and I wanted to, I was, I've been debating whether to, to mention this at all, but like, like the most, I don't know if it's, he's still the most popular YouTuber, but you know, the, the most popular widely subscribed YouTuber, PewDiePie, um, actually does film reviews from time to time. But it's usually just him saying, like, I saw a movie and uh, this is my feelings <laughs> about it. And the thing is, like, PewDiePie is popular entirely because of his personality. Right. He's just he's like fun to watch. And he 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 is he's kind of funny and he like edits his videos in kind of a like a self-deprecating humor kind of way. And but like no one would call him a film reviewer. Like he's not part of film reviewing YouTube. Yeah. It just it just it's just like that's a component of what is possible in this in this space. Right. And I think it's really cool that all these different movies, uh, all these different channels that we're talking about today, they're really quite different from each other yeah. in many ways. They're more different than they are similar even. Yeah. I, I think I, I, you're absolutely right. And I, I like the, so it, hearing you talk about that got me down a, a train of thinking with the idea of self identifying as a YouTuber and how, mm. and, and the negative connotation that comes from that good or bad and it's things like you know, it's things like logan paul that really hurt that brand right that like you say i'm if I, you can call i think you can call Lindsay ellis a film critic and a mm-hmm. film theorist i think you can absolutely give her that title and if she says i'm Lindsay ellis the film theorist that carries a certain amount of connotation if she says i'm Lindsay ellis the youtuber that is an entirely different connotation and they're both true. It's just all about perception. And that's, I think that's like the reason why we wanted to do this episode is that like, there's a lot of shit on YouTube. There is, there's a lot of terrible, awful things on YouTube. There's a lot of people trying to do the things that these people we've talked about today, um, trying to do that same thing, but are not doing it at the level that they are. And are doing 30 minute essays about something that doesn't really have anything to say. It's just, I want to cut this like a nerd writer, nerd writer episode, or I want to cut this like a Lindsay Ellis essay. And they do that and they don't do very well, but yeah. that doesn't mean that it doesn't have value at all. Or, or that that person isn't 
getting better and might right. eventually be good enough to, you know. Right. I mean, I, I, I'm i not going to single anyone out, but I follow someone on Twitter that has basically made it their life mission to shit on YouTube video essays. Mm-hmm. And like I, I sometimes I look at the ones he's he's shitting on because like, oh, you're not you don't have anything to, interesting to say about Ridley Scott here. Or it's something that someone else has explored or everyone that makes movies new. And I look at the channel and they've got like maybe maybe a couple thousand subscribers. Maybe they do, you know, two to three thousand views a, a video. And it's like, what? Why are you why are you attacking the little tiny people that like they're just trying to make something on the internet and show and share something with people? Like what what is the point of yeah. attacking those people? They're not like they're not holding themselves up as the the ultimate authority on these things. They just say, I have a perspective on this. Here's my perspective. And I'm sharing that with you. And if you like it, great. If you don't agree with me, that's okay. And I yeah. just don't get that mentality. I don't understand it. And that's something I see on film Twitter a lot. And that, I mean, that's because Twitter is a toxic, terrible website. But um, I, I just I don't I don't understand it, especially yeah. when you have stuff like this, which are like the best examples, in my opinion, of what the site can do. Like, I, I don't get it. I mean, unfortunately, I feel like I do kind of get it because I, I feel like certain of the web communities I've been part of in the past do have that sort of sneer club attitude where it's like, the entertainment of this community comes from the fact that we all get together and we like compete for the sickest burns on whatever the thing is. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, and it doesn't even tend to matter what the target is. It's, yeah. it's just a weird monkey thing that we do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it is, it is like, frankly, from where I'm sitting now in my old age, sort of a extremely unworthy way of spending your time. And I think that's why like, we we have evolved to being like desirous of being more positive about things just because yeah. it's like, what is the real point of yeah. being otherwise? Right. I think it's easy. It's easy to be negative. It takes a lot more work to do what movies with Mikey does and finding the joy in, in stuff that you like. And yeah. Yeah. And, and I yeah. think, I mean, and that's not to say everyone we talk, every, every YouTuber we talked about today is, is relentlessly positive. But I think they're, I think they're they're worthy of, of a claim at least. Yeah, right. Or if, if most of them, they're either positive or they're or they're sort of neutral in the sense that they're just making some point. It's right. not a, it's not about good or bad. Or they're it's telling just, a joke. Yeah. Like everyone loses shit at Red Letter Media when they don't review a comic book movie positively, and it's like they're like half kidding throughout this whole thing because the movies right. that Red Letter Media really wants to talk about are the ones that no one would would watch them talk about. Yeah, right. That's that's what I was gonna say. Is like I'm. You can be negative, but at least be funny while you're being negative. That's, right. Right. That's all I ask. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's fair. Um. Do we want to before we wrap this thing up? Do we want to go? You want to go talk about cinema sins a little bit? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, speaking of you know wanting to to be negative and rag on things, <laughs> cinema sins is just god awful. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Like, there, there, honestly, I, I what I do recommend is I recommend you. What is the what is the other channel called? The Everything Wrong with Cinema Sins channel? Yeah. Or, or, is that, is that what it's called? I don't no, know. I think he has, he, he posts those videos. I'll look it up while you're talking, but he posts those okay. videos, but, um, that's not the primarily primary thing he does on his channel. Yeah. So his channel's named something else. Yeah. But th- this other guy does a much better takedown of cinema sins than I could do just riffing on it. But cinema sins is this channel that, that like they, they run through a movie and they just say random things that they that they either didn't like or didn't understand but like ascribe them to being a flaw in the movie Mm -hmm. and this would like the the problem the problem isn't that the problem is actually more that people are stupid than it is that that the channel (laughs) is doing anything particularly bad because people will be like yeah you're right you're right um uh the shining did suck because of those things that you didn't understand in it (laughs) that you're now making your video about yeah, and and there are people that are listening to this podcast that probably really like CinemaSins, and that's okay. I'm not telling you not to like something. My my issue with it is exactly what you're saying, is that they hide behind this idea of satire and this idea of it's all a joke and you're taking it too seriously. But people, like, 
whenever I see someone comment on one of these videos saying, I liked this movie and you made me not like it anymore, I die. Because that's terrible. That's that's the exact opposite thing you want to do. No one like you should not you should not do that to a person, especially on a thing that proclaims to be satire and joking. Like that's not what you should be striving for and i feel like that's that's like this channel has found their lane they exist in this place where they know how to game the click system to get the most clicks possible like the title of their movies do that the the everything wrong with blank in in 10 minutes or less or whatever the 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 movie the movies that they pick at different times to to basically game the system to get as many clicks as possible and it's just it feels I don't know, just so like devoid of any kind of actual merit. Like you're not getting anything from it. Like, and there are times when they point out legitimate like mistakes that the movie has made. And I'll be like, Oh yeah, that's, that's true. But then it's yeah. mixed in with, I thought of a joke and I'm going to make my joke a sin for some reason. Right. And like 45 minutes of, of studio logos. I'm like, okay, that's, what are we doing? What are we doing? Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's it's a bit of a toxic approach. Like, I, I bet I could make you, like, dislike democracy <laughs> if, if, if I just if I just like did like a fire hose of of snarky talking points yeah. about it and like didn't give you a chance to think about any of them. You would just and, and and what sucks about the human mind is that you you actually they would all sort of lodge in your brain, and then you would just walk away from it. And then they would just kind of fester because that's how mm -hmm. we work as animals. Yeah. Um, like because it's it's actually true that if you like read something and then some and then like you later learn that it wasn't true, it's actually very hard to like edit the fact that it's not true into your brain. Um, so, it, yeah, like if you take like the last thing you would ever want to do is watch a uh, cinema sins about a movie you like because they're actually going to successfully erode your feelings about the movie, <laughs> even though they have no actual legitimate points about it. I just, yeah. yeah, just like as a format, I'm like, yeah, this should actually be like a, 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 a cognitive hazard, like put yeah. a, put a, put a big sign on it. It's like only watch this. If you have a stalwart constitution and you, you know what you're getting into. Yeah. And, th and there are absolutely people out there who will, will greedily, you know, well, greedily is the wrong word. We'll, we'll eagerly, watch each one of these videos and recognize that it's not to be taken seriously and recognize that this is in no way shape or form legitimate criticism or film discussion and just like it as the stupid kind of fun entertaining thing i think um the the honest trailers account does something very similar to that but in in a much less toxic way in my opinion where they're just supposed to be like fun videos about movies that just click this on enjoy it for a little bit and then go on with your life um yeah, at least there's a there's something that could legitimately be called satire or, yeah. or irony going and on. That's, with those. And that's like, and I don't want to get into it here. Like, I think CinemaSins fundamentally misunderstands what satire is, and I, I think that's why it's dangerous because it hides behind this veneer of satire without really understanding what satire is and how it works. And yeah. for for information on how what satire is and how it works, listen to Lindsay Ellis's video <laughs> on on satire. Um, which is a really great one. Cool. So yeah, let's not talk about cinema sins anymore. If you like it, keep keep liking it. I'm not. I would never tell you to stop, but I I, I just can't stand it. Yeah, it's just an info hazard, and you should take mm -hmm. you know appropriate precautions. All right. So that's all I think. Did you have anyone else you wanted to talk about before we wrap this thing up? I I don't think I did. Okay. Um, well, that's all. Uh, like I said, we're going to put each and every one of these YouTube artists in our show notes. So if you have never heard of these things and want to give them a chance and try them out, uh, you can do that via our links. So I hope this was educational. I hope I enjoyed this conversation a lot, Matt. I hope it is interesting to listen to. I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah, we'll see. All right. So let's wrap this thing up by talking about what we have been watching. What have you? been watching what have i been watching well i asked you first so you better tell me as always in this segment uh, each week we will take turns highlighting one or two things that we've been watching reading playing 
doing whatever. Um, this is for items that we didn't want to devote a whole show to, but still want to bring to everyone's attention, either positively or negatively. So, Matt, do you have anything this week that you've been doing? You know, I'm I, I'm gonna go be gonna go see Annihilation uh, in a couple hours, yeah. but uh, by the time you listen to this, I'll have watched it. But no, I I don't think I've consumed anything new this week. All right. Um, I, that's okay. Cause I want to talk about Red Sparrow a little bit because right. Red Sparrow is the movie that came out this weekend. It's the Jennifer Lawrence, um, vehicle, I guess. Uh, it also has Joel Egerton in it and Jeremy Irons. Um, it's a spy thriller directed by Francis Lawrence. And you know, one of the, those movies, Matt, where you just come out of it and you're like, this is exactly middle of the road. This was <laughs> neither bad nor was it particularly good. That's what Red Sparrow is for me. Um, it's two hours and 20 minutes long. It's too long to be a mediocre movie. And I think Jennifer Lawrence is, is pretty good, but man, Matt, her Russian accent really comes and goes. <laughs> it's, okay. uh, it's, it's, it's serviceable in some places. And then you're like, you can tell she says a word that she just doesn't know how to pronounce with a Russian accent. And it's just completely Americanized. And it's like nails on a chalkboard. Um, that's funny. But this is based off a book. Uh, the whole the whole idea that the the film is that um, there's a Russian ballerina who breaks her leg, and then her uncle, who is a member of the Russian secret service organization, whatever, gives her an opportunity to join a group called the Sparrows, which are just basically like spies that use sex to get what they want. So she has to go to the Sparrow School. It's very familiar. If, if you know the the Black Widow story in uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe at all. It's, it's basically the same thing. Um, okay. I don't know if the book, I don't know where the book got this idea, if it was a real thing that existed or if they just kind of took it from the MCU idea or whatever. Um, but it's basically, yeah, like super spy who can use sex to get what she wants. And it's a, it's a, it's a typical spy thriller where you don't know who's working for who and on what side they're on. And, and the reveal of that is half the fun of the film. And it, it it works in places, but I found it just a little... It's it's slow. I don't think most people are going to like this movie because it is very slow rolling. It, it, it doles the story out to you very slowly. Um, Jennifer Lawrence and Joel Egerton are supposed to have a uh, attraction and chemistry with each other. I don't think they do. <laughs> so that hurts the movie a lot. Um, and I, I think they're both very good actors. So I think it's just sometimes you can't make a relationship work. I think the the Russian accent doesn't help doesn't help okay. Jennifer. I I sort of had no inclination to see this movie at all in the first place, and uh, you have not encouraged me in the other direction. So yeah, I I I only saw it because I read a review from a critic that I usually agree with that uh, was shocked at how how much they liked it. And sorry, I don't I don't agree. <laughs> um, okay, this is it feels like oh the Red Sparrow is on HBO. Let's watch it. That's what it feels like to me. And yeah, you'll probably just, want to turn it off about halfway through. Yeah, I was just imagining. I was just imagining. Like, I bet if this movie was on TV, I probably would just switch off of it. Um, just it just doesn't sound like my cup of tea. It it would definitely okay. be the type of movie where if you had access to your phone, um, not in a movie theater, <laughs> your phone would be out before too long. Yeah, right. Which usually is an indication that I don't need to be watching that. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. All right, so that's all I had for this week, and that's all we have for all of you this week um if you have any questions or comments or just want to say hey you can reach out to us via email at dailyplanetfilms at gmail.com or on twitter at daily planet films uh, we do try to respond to just about everything we get either uh in the next episode of the podcast or we'll respond directly to you so so feel free to reach out yeah if, if you're not already subscribed to this podcast we encourage you to do so and ensure you never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, uh -huh. Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else podcasts can be found. We have got tons of great content here and more coming every day. We just finally split off our Vow to View show into its own podcasting feed. So if you listen to that as well as this podcast, you should go subscribe to that new feed because we are going to be splitting that off and, and, and letting that one grow on its own away from the main, the main channel. So subscribe to that one too do it Exciting. yeah 
Uh, if you like what we do here and do want to support us, you can consider becoming a patron of The Daily Planet. You can pledge a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford to help ensure we keep growing and keep making new shows. We've got we've got a bunch of them in the pipe, Matt. It's so fun to to see all of our, our plans and how they're coming, and, and I can't wait to share them with everyone. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, so head on over to patreon.com slash dailyplanetfilms and look up uh, our, our patron account and all the exclusives we have for each of our each of our patrons because we we like to to thank them for supporting us by giving them giving them cool stuff yeah yeah like the discord channel yeah yeah so please consider rating and reviewing us on itunes every review helps us get more exposure and and introduces new people to the content we make here yeah and i guess we should say that we will like some people i like reading the reviews out loud even if they're bad ones so if you take (laughs) the time to rate and review us we will take the time to thank you personally on air so please please do that yeah absolutely and next week on the podcast matt we will be reviewing a wrinkle in time the newest disney film directed by ava duvernay and based off the book written by madeline lang lingle lang how you pronounce it it? lingle okay uh i am very interested to see how this movie turns out because the trailers have not hooked me, but I love Ava DuVernay. So I'm very much looking forward to having this conversation next week with whoever it ends up being. I'm not sure who's going to end up seeing it, but we will be here. I will be here with someone to talk about A Wrinkle in Time next week. So uh, we'll see you all then. Podcast is over. It's done. We hope you all had some fun. Go back to your work or your school. Jim, hey, that's cool. Regardless, just go away. But please come back next Friday.